Yes, no. We're good. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Yay! Okay, so as per usual, I know sometimes we have those that kind of filter in later. Just give them grace and let them through. We do have quite a few missing today. Um, we have the Gellerts and Suds. They're down visiting their son slash brother who had shoulder surgery um, a week ago. So they're down helping him. So we'll just keep um, him in prayer and their family lifted up. And of course, uh, we have a few that are traveling this weekend. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. As always, if you have need of a Bible, please make sure you grab one. That is for you. Do not worry about leaving it. Take it. We can always get more. So if you need one, please make sure you grab that. Again, you do know that if you have need of prayer, we do have <laughs> prayer cards over there. And I definitely want to make sure that that's just reiterated. And that's something that we're also getting ready to start with our young people too, for our youth and for our kids church, that they have little areas where they, if they have a prayer request, they don't have to put their name on it, but if they got something going on in their heart, something maybe it's hard to talk about right now, but if I can just put it down on paper and just trust, just know, again, these are things that are not shared. If you do want to divulge who, you know, your name on it so we can partner in prayer, that's fine as well. But just know that these things do not just get passed around. No. This comes around our leadership and we definitely lay hands on it. And we do pray and intercede for you. So just know that, but we're also wanting to introduce this to our kids too, so that they know that that they are not alone in whatever that they're walking through and facing today. So I know this gets repeated every single week, but that is part of the purpose of the church, y'all, is being able to come together to be able to pray with one another in one mind and one accord in unity. And when we're hurting, guess what? We're all supposed to hurt. And when we're celebrating, we're all supposed to celebrate. So with that in mind, again, they are over on the counter. Fill it out. Please put it in the offering box. And or if at any time you feel like you need prayer, especially during worship, please come grab Pastor Corey or one of us or the person next to us. Because again, it's not about being a pastor, being able to pray with you. It's about one another because we're all called to be ministers of the gospel. So with that said, a couple of things coming up this month, first and foremost. So this Wednesday, um, there's a free worship event. It's at the chapel. They are out on Northwest Blitchton Road. I do have the address on the um, little advertisement over on the counter over there. And it's the first Wednesday of every month. Doors open at 615. They provide a small dinner. And then at seven o'clock, they have worship. It's usually about an hour hour and a half at the most, but it's just a wonderful time of just anybody can come, they can fellowship, they can worship. Sometimes we need that during the midweek, right? We just need a little bit of that encouragement, a little bit of that refreshing, sometimes just going and being able to sit and soak. Mm -hmm. But um, that is this Wednesday, which is September 4th at 615. If you need further information, the address is located over on there. And so secondly, Beating the Fearless is coming up on Wednesday, September 11th. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for those that have already signed up to volunteer. I do have one volunteer spot left. So if maybe you've been thinking about it like, oh, I don't know, this is a great way to get yourself out there and just being able to give back to the community. So if you are interested in wanting to go ahead and take that spot, please go ahead and sign up. And this way, if you don't have a shirt, we can get one for you this week. And um, it'll be at the Mojo's on 200 by Target. I believe we'll be meeting there at 9 because it's going to run from like 9.30 to 11.30. And it's where we're actually helping loading vehicles as they come around to for them to take to the first responders as a thank you for their service and all that they do for the community. So if you have any questions about that further, just come see me after service and I'll be happy to get that to you. Um, we also have coming up another free event. Who here heard of or actually attended the Jesus Rally last year? Anybody? All right. So if you're not sure what that is, so that was at the World Equestrian Center. This year, they're having the Jesus Fest at Lakeware High School. So our neighbor right down the road. It's going to be on Sunday, the 22nd. The gates will open at 3.30. It actually starts at, I believe, 5, 5.30. I'll have to get, figure out. the. I'll nail down the time. But it is a free event again. So they just say, bring your lawn chairs, bring an umbrella just in case because it is outdoors. They will have food trucks there. So if you are hungry or whatnot, but they're really wanting to open this up. They're not doing registration or tickets like they did in the past. They just want this to know that this is open to any and all who would like to come. So bring your families, bring your friends, bring your neighbors. It is open to all, but that's going to be on Sunday, the 22nd gates open at 3 30. Um, we're actually going to be there at three o'clock because house church will be representing at the Jesus Valley this year, along with about, I think there's about 60 churches, other churches in our community that we're all going to there. 
It's really going to be cool. awesome. So we're just going to set up a little tent and it's not about recruiting people. It's not about, it's just to be there mm -hmm. to pray for those. They're going to have baptisms set up there because they're just believing for a move of God that, that this is going to be life changing impact. And what, this is the church coming together on a grander scale. So we're just really excited to see that so many pastors are wanting to get on board in our community saying, you know what, it's not about, oh, house church or city light or wings of faith or, you know, it's not about any of that. It's about, Hey, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And our biggest common denominator is as we want to see souls saved for Christ. And so that's what it's about is seeing Ocala get saved, Marion County saved for Jesus. So again, that information is over there. If you want to take a screenshot, just put on your calendar. We would love to see as many that can come out and be a part. And also again, we have a youth group now. We are so super excited. We had our first meeting this past Wednesday. It'll be every single Wednesday night um, from 6 to 8 p.m. here. Yes. Oh, yes. Our youth. Our youth are missing this morning. That's okay. But uh, it was a great evening. I really believe we had a really great evening. We had our two. And guess what? It only takes one to change the world, right? And we talk about small in numbers, but listen, guys, even what we have here, what God's doing here is amazing how God is opening doors and avenues and is really putting, it's not about putting house church on the map. It's about saying, hey, here's another brick to the building of the kingdom of heaven. And it's just so awesome to see being established for his good glory. But on that note, again, every Wednesday night, 6 to 8 p.m., if you're interested if maybe you've been thinking, like, the Lord's been calling me to serve in youth. I'm not sure what that looks like. Please, just come, sit in, take a look and see what's going on. We had a great night of brainstorming, of going over how things are going to go, what we're looking for. We were asking the kids for their participation and what they would like to see. And it was just really encouraging to see them excited about what they were able to have um, this evening um, for them. Yep. Go ahead and have a seat, gentlemen. I'm glad you're ready, though. Our, oh, our gentlemen like are going to be helping us today a little bit as our ushers, since our ushers are currently with their son. Um, and then last but not least, we have our baptism coming up at the end of this month. Ooh. And we're also going to have our felt. No, get excited about that. That's amazing. I mean, we have like six or seven people signed up and the month's not even done. So that is definitely something to be excited about. And guys, this is an opportunity for you to invite your friends, your families, anybody that you would love to be there on that moment. It could be your first time. It could be maybe you're rededicating your life to the Lord. But nonetheless, we are there to celebrate, and that's what it's about, and it's about Christ. And we're also having our fellowship dinner that day. So we do have a sign-up list and the menu. So if you'd like, again, invite your friends and family. This is a great time for them to come out, especially for maybe someone who's never been to church, and they're just kind of like, oh, I don't know, guys. But hey, everybody likes free food. So and the but, sooner we know, the better it would be, just in case we just for preps. a larger crowd than what we're normally Yeah, have, and we can prepare we accordingly. Can set up the tent if need be. Yes. So, we can make sure we fit everybody. so all of that is over there. Definitely go ahead and stop by the counter on your way out today. And last but not least, but thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your support, your prayers, your time, your talent, your treasures, everything that is you that brings to the glory of God. And with that, we're going to give it to Pastor Corey. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So a lot of exciting things going on, right? A lot of, for a little fellowship, we're doing a lot. And that's the idea. Um, Paul actually said it was the smallest church that was in the greatest, you know, impoverishment that gave the most. Even out of some of the bigger churches, this one itty bitty church that was, you know, struggling, supported Paul for over a year in his ministry and his travels and everything. I'm like, it's not the numbers, it's the heart. God will always take care of that. Uh, so it's kind of cool. Another thing, you see me wearing Isaiah house. Um, Isaiah 117 house uh, thing they have going on. It's for our kiddos uh, that are in the foster system. Um, this is so they don't end up going into the office and they can actually go to a house. Because a lot of times they get going to like a government office whenever they get picked up and removed from the home. So they're on the floors. They're resting on the floors, on these tile floors and carpeted, whatever floors, digi floors. Because again, it's a government office, but that's where these kids are getting picked up when they have to be removed from the home and sat at until they're able to be processed into a foster home or wherever they're going. Um, Isaiah House is there to fill in the gaps. So they actually go to a home. These kids are going to know that they're loved, that they're cared for, um, and that they are, you know, yes, it's a tough situation, but some of these kids go in, they have maybe clothes, maybe not. Uh, some of the babies go in with dirty diapers. I mean, like, not just because they're dirty, they're gross diapers. Haven't been bathed. I mean, there's a lot of things going on with these kids. Um, so that's another area of ministry that we are looking to partner with. Um, 
because that is something this county needs. Um, I think, what was it, last month there was 10 kids that were removed. A uh, month before that, uh, there was even, I think there was eight or nine, um, but it varies. But every month, these kids are being removed from homes. Yeah. So that's a big deal. And the speaker made a point. It's the church's job to make sure that's taken care of. That should never be the government's responsibility. That's the church's job, not just ours. That meeting we had the other night, there was a lot of people there on board to help make this happen. Uh, another local pastor, he had additional property that he, God felt, hey, you need to give this to somebody. He sought the Lord who to give it to. He met up with Isaiah House. So Isaiah House is actually getting part of that property donated to them. So they're going to build on the property. Everything's going to be there. It's going to be their property. The church isn't going to have nothing to do with it other than the fact it was a gift. Uh, but they're going to help support that, that ministry. Uh, so that's a big deal. Uh, so guys, whenever you guys are given your offerings and things like that, and your tithes and offerings, that's what we're doing. We're giving out to Isaiah House. We're going to be giving out to his house for her. We're giving to the Rock Program. These, these ministries that are reaching back into this community to make a difference. And that's what we're trying to do. We want to make a difference. We may not have the hands, but the resources that we have, we're going to give uh, because we want to make sure they're blessed because it, it does. It, it takes many hands to make the work light. And if we can be part of the many hands, let's do that. Let's make that happen. Amen? Uh, so let's go ahead and pray. Let's get after this thing this morning. Oh, and another positive note before I, we pray. Um, I, was, I did get access to a tub warmer. So the water will be warm for baptism. You won't be getting in cold water. Um, sorry, it just it crossed my mind. It's one of those things, shoo, went, flew through and I had to catch it. We got the tub warmer, right? Because let's face it, that, that water's you know coming out of a well and it's like 72 degrees when it comes out of the well. If you don't like cold water, it can be a little chilly. So maybe that's why the bubbles go faster. Um, I'm breathing heavier. <laughs> well, Lord, we thank you for today, God. We thank you for the opportunity to be here today, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, God, your grace and your mercy, God. Thank you for giving us what we don't deserve and not giving us what we do. And uh, Father, your love is just so, so amazing. And Lord, we thank you that we get to participate in that. God, that you invite us in to that. Uh, Lord, not just to experience it, but also to give it and to be that for others. Lord, you, you called us to be children. You called us to be sons uh, and not just slaves and not just servants. You called us into fellowship. You called us into family. And uh, Father, that's what we believe that we are here at House Church. We're family. And uh, Father, you've called us together for a purpose, and that's to reach this community, God. God, to reach those that have been over-churched and under Jesus, God. Lord, that we're, we are going to be connecting those that are disconnected. And uh, Lord, that we just that they find a place where they can come to know you. And Father, and have a family to do it with. So Father, we just thank you. We bless you this morning. God, take your word. Do with it what you always do. You increase it. You multiply it. You make it real to those that are hearing. Uh, Father, both those that are online uh, and those that are in service today. Father, we just thank you for them. We bless them, God. We speak life over them, Lord. And God, for those that are dealing and struggling right now with sickness in the body, uh, Father, we just speak life over them, God, right now. Lord, we command every sickness, it will bow its knee to your name. Father, everything that has a name, everything that has a name must bow. And Lord, these diseases, they have names now. And Lord, we, we, we speak to those. Father, we speak to cancer right now in the name of Jesus. You will bow and submit to the name of Jesus. You will come off these kids, the, off your kids, God. That disease cannot stay there in Jesus' name. So, Father, we thank you for that. Those that are dealing with emotional issues, Lord, the depression, anxiety, all of these things that kind of get lumped together. Father, Lord, we speak your peace be upon them right now, that their mind is settled, their emotions are settled. Father, that they are at peace with you, God. And, Lord, that where there's things that have been, you know, wounds over the years, because sometimes life does happen, Father, and there's things that people take on. Lord, we speak healing to those wounds right now, that they are no longer their identity. Lord, they, they quit identifying as the thing that happened to them. But, Father, they identify with what happened to you that set them free. But, Father, they make that connection instead of to those horrible events that happened, realizing that's not who they are. That's something they went through. And, Father, that test is going to turn into a testimony, God, to give you glory. So, Father, you have a way of turning all of those things that were ugly and turn it into something beautiful. God, you take beauty, or turn ashes into beauty. So we thank you, and we bless you, Lord. We thank you for this morning, God. Let your word come alive. Let your spirit have its way here this morning. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Open the ears of the hearer. Open the hearts to receive. Open the eyes to see your truth this morning. And God, we just bless you. We thank you. We give you glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 So uh, just a little bit in Romans this morning. We are going to continue working our way through Romans. But as I was going through this last night, some stuff just kept hitting and I couldn't get away from it. So guess what? That's what we're doing. Uh, that's where we're going to be at. Because uh, I believe when the Holy Spirit does that, there's a reason he's doing that. 
Um, I heard one pastor said, look, it's not rabbit trails, it's Holy Ghost leading. Um, and he's right, because sometimes something will happen while we're speaking and the Holy Spirit will drop something and we kind of run off on that thing. Someone needs to hear it. And it may not be you at the moment, but you may talk to somebody down the road that needs to hear it. It, it may happen, stance, just, you know, whatever, you don't need it now. But an event comes up or circumstance comes like, man, I just heard that. Somebody just said that. And it comes back. And the Holy Spirit has a way of just bringing those things back. So that's kind of where we're going to be at this morning. So if you would, go ahead and Romans 8. That's where we're going to start at. We're not going to stay there. And it's not 8 through 30, 18 through 39. I didn't edit that. My bad. It's 18 and 19 out of Romans 8. That's where we're going to start at. I love Paul's writings because Paul went through it. And anybody that's read through the New Testament, you can see where Paul went through some stuff. He was stoned. He was beaten. Right? He was left for dead. He was shipwrecked. He was out in the sea a day and a night. I mean, Paul went through it. Right? He suffered the 39 lashes, which is the Jewish way of discipline, a couple of times um, and survived. Uh, so think about that one for a second. Uh, people say, well, Jesus had that. No, he didn't. He actually went through the Roman scourging. Um, there is a difference. So Jesus didn't get 39 stripes. If you'll actually look at what he went through, he was not scourged according to the Jewish custom. It was the Roman custom. So it was a fair game. Most people uh, that were scourged by the Roman system, they died before they made it off the whipping post. So that's what Jesus went through. So I just want to clear that up because some, there, there is that teaching out there. And I thought it for many years until I got to really looking back at the scripture. I'm like, wait a minute. No, that wasn't the Jewish custom he went through. That was Pilate had him scourged. So that was Roman scourging. That's where the cat of nine tails and all that come forth, you know, that basically the tips of that thing had little hooks and stuff that literally peeled the flesh from Jesus' body. Um, and that's just... Whew. So consider that because we are going to be doing communion this morning. It is first uh, Sunday, so we will be doing communion this morning. But remember what Jesus went through for you, for me, because of his love. He didn't back off. He didn't run away. He didn't call down angels to stop it. He willingly did it. It didn't cry out. Think about that one for a second. Like a lamb through the slaughter, he stayed silent. And even when he was up on the cross, he was still interceding on behalf of those that put him there. I mean, realistically, he was murdered. But he did say, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. And there's a reason for that. You can't kill righteousness. Realistically, most people, like I said, what Jesus went through should have been dead before he made it through the cross. But he was perfectly righteous. Can't take that out. <laughs> because death has no part in righteousness. Does that make sense? You can't touch it. So Jesus up on the cross, he's still having conversations on the cross. He shouldn't have been able to speak, but he spoke with a loud voice for all to hear. That's love. That's, that's the goodness of God. So I want to keep that in mind, but I love Paul's view of this. Verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Isn't it interesting what you're willing to go through when you have a promise on the other side? When you know what's coming, what you're willing to suffer through to get to it. right? Some people go to the gym, right? That's, that's an internal suffering. That is eternal because you're always going to hurt when you go to the gym. right? So get used to being uncomfortable. That, that's the gym, right? That's gym life. Get used to being in pain. Because you're constantly stretching. You're constantly tearing down muscles. You're constantly building. So it's an ongoing thing. But what are you looking for? You're not looking at the pain. You're not looking at all that. You're looking at the result on the end of it. Uh, for those moms that have had babies, you understand this. The pain you go through in the moment kind of gets subsided a little bit, especially sometimes a lot whenever you see that life that's now in your hands. right? That, that newness of life that's there. And everything changes. Yes, it was, it was awful in the moment. But that baby that's now there, like, whoa. The life that is there. So the comparison, right? That, that's what he's saying. When you start looking at certain things, say, so look at any the troubles that I'm going through. Psh, who cares? It's not even a thing to get my mind off the prize, right? The children of Israel had a promise, but they went through the wilderness and did nothing but complain on the way. And they kept complaining. They kept complaining for forty years. They kept complaining. Could you imagine being with a group of people that complained for forty years? I've said this before. If I was Moses, I don't think I would hit the rock. I would hit those people standing closest to me. <laughs> I would have spoke to the rock. I would have, okay, rock, you produce water. People are like, oh, I wish you'd get this stuff. I mean, 40 years. And even most at one point said, why are you complaining against us? Why are you coming to us complaining? Has God not done all these things? We have shade that keeps us cool during the day. We have fire that keeps us warm during the night. If you're in the desert, it gets extremely cold. That fire was hot enough to warm almost 2 million people. 
Think about that for a second. The shade was enough to cover almost 2 million people as they're traveling through the desert. The water that came forth from the rock, and if I understand correctly in Scripture, I remember right, the rock actually followed them, which I'm still trying to figure that one out. That provided water for them. Water from a rock, it provided for them. Two plus million people. When they come out of Egypt, not one of them was sick or infirm. Something happened at the Passover. I mean, statistically, that's not possible. To have that many people together, none of them sick. None of them infirm, none of them handicapped, no, no, no disabled people. That many people come out of Egypt. And when they come out, they come out wealthy. The Bible says they plundered Egypt. That's a lot. They, they, they took some money when they come out of there. Right? I think it was restoration because of what was taken from them over the years making them slaves. I think it was good payback. Amen? So, but you can either have their attitude and complain all the way through the process, even though you have a promise, or you can say, you know what? I'm trusting in the promise. I'm not going to worry about the process. I'm not going to stress over the process because if this is what is happening to get me to my promise, and praise God because God's working something out of me, it's going to make me better. It's going to make me stronger. It's going to make it to where when the storms come, those things come, I can stand, right? Some of y'all have been through some trials, right? You've been through some hardships, but now looking back at it, if that ever comes again, you know exactly what you need to do. You know that you can make it through it because you've already made it through it once, right? That's why I look at it. If I've already been through something, what else can you do? I've already been through that. Okay, whatever. Now I have a better perspective on how to do it. I learn. I grow. Now, if you don't want to learn and grow, you might repeat the process. Well, you know, learn better. Right? But don't beat yourself up. How many of you all have gone through something and you seem like you're going through it again, but then you start beating yourself up because you're going through it again? Is that going to help you through it? Or is that going to make it worse? Don't beat yourself up because it comes back around. Okay, well, crap, I missed it the first time and I'm almost missing it now. I ain't going to miss it no more. This, I ain't doing this again. When you make the determination that you're not going to do it again, I promise you, you won't. If you're truly legitimate about it, you're not going to go through the process again, you'll, you'll settle it and you won't do it again. Right? You heard that, that, that saying, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired? <laughs> when you finally get to that place and you say no, that's when things are going to shift. That's when it's going to make the difference in your life. When you said enough's enough and you settle it, it's not going to be until you settle it that it's going to stop. I mean, it has to be nail in the coffin, done, no more. Because if you keep playing with it, it's going to keep having the opportunity to mess with you. Right? That's also faith. Whenever faith is, you're settled in something, it'll keep happening for you. If you're unsettled in it, that's a wavering mind. The Bible says you need not expect anything from the Lord if you have a wavering mind. Uh, in Galatians, you settle it. One, one process, one thought path, okay? If we have GPS, what? It keeps us on a path, right? Now, if we pass our turn, what is it? Rerouting. The idea is to get you right back to where you're supposed to be. Sometimes you need to let the Holy Spirit be your GPS, and if you get off track, He can reroute you. So be willing to listen. I don't do like we do, turn the thing off on the thing so it shut up, quit talking to us. I know a better route. Yeah, we found that one out a while back. We were trying to go to a dinner. We were like an hour and a half late because <clears throat> I knew a better route. <sighs> trying to miss the lights and stuff. Should have listened. How many of y'all got sidetracked knowing a better route? Is that fair? Okay. So it seems like we've all had some common experiences, huh? And then interesting, the scripture talks about that, to not worry about stuff like that because all of your brothers and sisters across the world have been through like things you've been through. You're not, you're not the only one that's been through it. You're not alone. So here's a perfect example. None of us are alone. We've all had that rerouting process. And it's an okay thing to go through, right? So <clears throat> he said it's not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation awaits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For all of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. What is that? That the sons of God, those that would be considered sons of God. Notice it doesn't say the son, it says sons of, or the children of God, to show up and show out. That's what manifestation means, to show up, show out. Make yourself known. If all of creation is groaning for that, then why are we just meeting in our four walls and not making an impact on the community around us? Why is it that a lot of church culture has made it to where it's, let's build a huge building and gather a bunch of people, but we don't really do anything around us? Right? I'm not against large buildings. I'm not against big fellowships. I'm not against any of that. Please hear me. Because sometimes I say stuff and I think, oh crap, they're going to be thinking I'm against this stuff. I'm against it if it's not being used to build the kingdom. Right? If, you're, if you're using it to build God's kingdom, man, I'm all for it. Let's get it done. But if the only thing you're doing is building your kingdom, that's where I struggle. That's where I have a hard time. Right? Like I know in the past few weeks I've been talking about the warm fuzzies and stuff like that during worship. I don't have a problem with warm fuzzies during worship. 
but I don't want it to be something that's manufactured. I don't want it to be something that's, you know what I mean, where I'm, I'm stoking the emotions and it's not the spirit. Now, your body will respond to the spirit. Okay, whenever the spirit's moving, your body will respond. It may be the tinglys, it may be the goosebumps, it may be whatever. Your body will respond to the moving of the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's just a recognition of the presence that he's there. But if that's all you're going for, instead of just a knowing that he's there, you can miss it because what? Some things can be manufactured, right? The devil's a liar. He can, he can manufacture stuff. This is where I have to get to where your faith is not based on your feelings. So if your faith is not based on your feelings, we can celebrate the warm fuzzies. We can utilize them and have a great time with the Lord. Right? That's what messes me up sometimes. I get excited about the word, and I don't know if I'm going to cry or laugh. I don't I have no idea at the time because I don't know what to do with myself. Because I'm just, it's, I'm overwhelmed with it, just what he's doing in here. And I'm like, I got to talk. You know, and it's like, that's, it's good as long as it's filtered through the Holy Spirit. And I, I love those things. But again, I don't want that to be the only experience that you have. Because how do you make it through the storm if you don't have the warm fuzzies? Does that make sense? That, that, I just want to make sure there's balance of what I'm saying. I don't want anybody to think I'm just one. <laughs> I'm only preaching against these. I'm not preaching against these things. If it's not filtered through the cross, not filtered through the Holy Spirit, that's where we got to bring it back in. But if you experience those and you know it's the Holy Spirit, man, go for it. I have no problem with that. Okay? When we're in during worship time, you want to raise your hands, raise your hands. You want to get on the floor and kneel before the Lord? That's you and the Lord at that time. It ain't nobody else's business what's going on. You worship God how you worship God. Now, if I, if I get the impression that it's in the flesh, I may, hey, I may tap you on the shoulder. So, hey, uh, let's, let's bring that back, right? Because Holy Spirit's discerning. He'll let you know what's what. But I've been in services that were absolutely off the chain. I mean, just like, whoa. But there was a complete peace. I mean, people doing stuff, I'm thinking, I have never seen anything like this in my life. But there was a peace. I've been in other services that was like that. There wasn't no peace. I'm like, yep, I'm out. <laughs> I ain't hanging out for this. Because it was making a mockery of the goodness of God. It was making a mockery of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit can work and manifest. Because again, whenever it's God, there's a peace. It might be different for you, but there's still a peace. Does that make sense? Yeah. How many of you have been in situations like, okay, first day of school? That could be awkward, right? You don't know nobody. It's a little awkward, but you know you're supposed to be there. That's, that's probably the best example I give you. It's, it's a little awkward, but you know it's okay. Right? It's okay. That's different. I'm not so sure. But it's okay. Something in here says it's okay. Just, just work through. Right? This is where we grow into the Lord. Right? I come out of a denomination where we didn't even talk about the Holy Spirit. And knowing that most of my family was from the other denomination, that's all they talked about was the Spirit. So I come out of that and I go into a church that's Spirit-filled. That, that's the term you know, that we get used. And I'm thinking, dear God, I hope this is you because, whoa. Right? Um, but I've also seen the, the overzealousness of some of that stuff to where it becomes a show. And it's, you can definitely tell it's more carnal than it is spiritual. Uh, but finding that balance to where, okay, yeah, the Spirit's moving, and people are being blessed, God's doing His thing, I'm all for that. I have no problem with that. Because what? Let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. <laughs> he ministers. He loves on people. And that's what we want Him to do. Amen? Amen? All right, so, the earth is waiting for us. Creation is waiting for the sons to manifest. Creation is waiting for us to step up, step out, and do what we're supposed to do, which is what? We're supposed to bring the glory of God to all of creation. And that's where we really have to go after this thing. Um, it is 1 Corinthians 5, 7, I believe, that talks about that because we were created in God's image that we are the glory of God. Okay, we are to represent the glory of God. And then right after that, it talks about woman being the glory of man. That's a beautiful passage. But if we're supposed to bring the glory of God to all of creation, are we doing that? Are we actually letting God manifest through us to others? You know, John Lake said, you know, you shouldn't have to manufacture the Holy Spirit. You should be able to produce the Holy Spirit at any given moment. You shouldn't have to work it up. You shouldn't have to build. You should be able to at any given time to be able to produce the Holy Spirit as a believer. What does that mean? If somebody needs something that the Holy Spirit's got, you should be able through you to have the Holy Spirit work. Now, that's a stretch for a lot of us because what? We're not used to that concept. We're not even, you know, anywhere close to that because we don't see that. That's a shame. And that's what I'm striving for. That's what I'm growing into. That's what I'm looking for. Because, Lord, if God is supposed to be working in and through me, and we have the power of the resurrection working in and through us, man, lives should be changed everywhere we go. Hearts should be changed. Minds should be changed. People just being around us should be impacted because we're there. Not because of anything we're, ooh, ah, we're special. It's because the Holy Spirit in us is making a change. Right? One pastor I listened to said he was working in a warehouse, and one of his supervisors was, like, like bad, sick. And they were trying to send him home, but... 
the, the supervisor realized that as he stayed around this guy, he felt better. He couldn't explain it. So he made it a point to be around this guy the rest of the night that they were working on the night shift. And he stayed well there. Come look for us. Like, we thought you were sick. He goes, I was. But I noticed every time I'm near him, I'm okay. And the pastor's like, I can tell you what that's about. He didn't say nothing. He just kept working. He didn't make it about him. He said, but after they said something about it, he goes, I can tell you why that is. <laughs> With a big grin on his face. But it was a sickness that was going around. And they had a big thing about, you know, days off from work. You can't miss any days from work. And it was like a big deal. Then the pastor starts feeling symptoms. He gets home. He's like, wait a minute. Uh-uh. So he goes into prayer, and he started to call in. He's like, no, I ain't calling in. I'm going to be perfectly fine. He woke up the next day. He was perfectly fine. He was miserable when he went to bed. He said, no, this isn't going to stick. This ain't happening. And he goes back in. The supervisor, I thought you weren't feeling good. He goes, I'm perfectly fine. Thank you very much. Let's go to work. Why? Because he had determined this is how it's going to be. Remember, faith is settled when you said, I'm not tolerating this stuff anymore. All right, parents, when you have enough of your kids, when, they, when you say enough's enough, and you're like, hey, you're like, and they cut it out. You got to be that way, right? When there's certain things in your life, you're going to have to settle it. Nope, this is how it is, and it stops right then. You know, when you finally settle it, it, it makes a change. But we need to understand who we are. And we've talked about this. I talked about this, well, months ago. Um, I talked about who we are, about being the sons of God. But it come back up, so here we are. John 1. Now, so this is young man John. He, he's writing this. This is John 1, starting verse 10. It's all about Jesus, right? This is the opening passage where in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word came and dwelt among man. Go down to verse 10, it says, He was in the world and the world was created through Him, yet the world did not know Him. Wow. He came to His own, His own people did not receive Him. Yet to all who received Him, He gave the power, the authority, the ability, the right to become sons of God or children of God. To those who believed in his name. To those who believed. He didn't limit that. He said to those who believed in his name. He gave what? The power, the authority, the right, the privilege, the honor to become sons. Now catch this. This is huge. Those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Right? So this wasn't just because a man and a woman came together and oop, there's a baby. It wasn't like that. It wasn't, oh, that's oh, we're making a baby. No. God ordained this because it wasn't about a physical birth. This was a rebirth to become the sons of God. So it's different, right? It's a whole other perspective. And we see that it's the will of God that we're here. If you're a believer, you're the will of God. Let that settle in. If you're a believer, you're the will of God. Every person is the will of God, but whether they choose to walk in it, it's a whole other story. If you're a believer, you're walking in the will of God. Because He willed for you to be here. Because He rebirthed you. He made you a son. How awesome is that? That's good news. Because what? Other religions, God, their God is so far out there, you can't make contact. You have nothing to do with them. And they want you to sacrifice, 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 to do some weird, nonsensical stuff. And you never have a relationship to them, and you only can hope that they do something for you. But we have a God that says, you know what? I want you to be my family. I want you to be my kids. I want to bless you. I want to pour out on you. I want to pour into you. I want you to look like me. I want you to do the things I would do. I want you to represent me. Wow. That's a big deal. Because what? Kids look like their parents. Right? My kids look like me, for the most part. Right? There's no denying my kids. You look at the pictures. I can't get away from it. They look like me. I think, you know, that one back there looks like his mom. I think Quinn kind of looks like his mom. But there's other times, like, no, they, I can't get away from them. They look just like me. Some of them act like me. But we should look like our father. We should be acting like our father because in the beginning, we were created in his image and his likeness. So what does that mean? We're supposed to be back to that, and that's what we should be representing to the world. But how often do we represent more of the world's image and likeness than we do his? Or how often do we represent religion's ideology and image to the world instead of his image. It's such a big deal that we get into the Word of God, and that's our mirror, right? The Bible talks about the Word being a mirror. That that when we're in the mirror, ladies, when y'all get in the mirror, what y'all doing? Y'all fixing, y'all making sure things right, you're plucking, you're doing the whole thing. Guys are like, okay, I'm good, let's go. Did you get the order? Crap, gotta go back and do the order. Right? But the idea is what? You're there, you're fixing, you're primping, you're making sure things are just right when you're in that mirror, because I look good when I go out. 
How about we do that with the Word? We got to start getting the words like, well, okay, that don't look like God. And you're looking at yourself, mm, no, I need to make some adjustments. I need to make some changes. Right? And you do that. And you don't have to like jump off the cliff necessarily unless you want to to make those changes. But little changes over time, what? You start becoming transformed. The Bible says, by the renewing of your mind, be transformed. Romans 12. Making new, making your mind new. What? It's the way you make your mind new is according to the word of God, not according to the word of man. Right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So then conversely, that means that what doubt would come by hearing or hearing the word of man. Okay? So he gave us that ability, and it's his will, right? It's the will of God that you're here. How awesome is that? That is amazing. I love that. Then you go over to old man John, first John. This is John in exile. He was on the island of Patmos, right? After being bold alive and went through a lot. First John 3, closer to Revelation. If you're looking for which direction to go. When you're there, say amen. amen. No overachievers? We're really, really loud. <laughs> So I was raised Baptist, man. We would have Bible drills, and boy, it was a race to see who get to that verse first. Yeah. I'm telling you, boy, it was it was on. It was a competition. You talking about violence in the church? I mean, we weren't even Pentecostal, and we we're ready to put hands on people, right? Because you know what? I got there first. No, I got there first, and it was it was rough. I mean, we're ready to throw the King James. What meaneth this? I was there first, and we just had fun with it. But we learned the Bible, and I just wish we would have learned more in depth about the Bible and just learn how to get there. So, everybody there? If not, you have the cheater screen. Just saying. All right. Now, it says, consider how much the love, how much love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. Children of God. Right? That's what he calls us. So when we talk about, well, I'm a child of God, it's all I've ever said, I'm a servant. I'm not a servant. I'm not going to lower my standards to say that I'm a servant if God calls me a son. Right? You know, so, well, I'm just a servant. I'm just his servant. No, 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 no. You're man's servant, right? We're here to serve man, not God. Does that make sense? That sounds a little weird for people that have been in church a long time. If we're sons, we don't serve the Father. Does that make sense? And now we do His will because that's what a son does. But it's not out of service, it's out of love. Right? If you're a child, I don't expect my children to serve me. Right? They have responsibilities, yes, but that's not service, that's out of love. If you're a child of God, then you respond out of love and you do because you love. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Not if you serve me. If you serve me, you ain't got an option. You're going to keep the commandments whether you love him or not. But when you do it out of love, it's at a greater depth, isn't it? Husband and wife, you serve your wife out of love. You serve your husband out of love. Well, because what? You love them. You want to see them happy. You want to see them taken care of. You want to see them in a better place. So what? That service is out of love, not out of what? You have to serve me. You put somebody with a thumb on it, you know what I mean? That's, that's not the idea. But religion says you have to be a servant. That's man's idea. Say, no, you're going to serve me. You're going to serve the pastor. You're going to do all this stuff. That stuff mm, irritates the mess out of me. When I see people elevate a pastor like that, and uh, it's almost like he's like just below God in the sense that like that pastor could do no wrong, and you're going to make sure his coffee's filled, his car is pretty. and it, That boggles me that they would make this man an idol and do all those things for him, and that he would be okay with it as a pastor. As a minister, how, how are you okay with that stuff? Pastor, teacher, okay, that's one. Evangelist, prophet, apostle. They're there to build the church. They're there to equip the church for the work of the ministry. So who should be on the limelight? The people, not one of those four. The people should be in the limelight. Why? Because they're doing the work of the ministry. The coaches for the football teams, they do a good job coaching, but who's, the players are the ones that get really a lot of the recognition, right? Because the players are on the field. They're doing the job. The coach was just there to get them to do it and to do it better. My job is basically to coach you into doing better so that when you're out there on the field, you can succeed. That when you're out there, you're getting the limelight, but what? It's bringing attention to who you are, right? Those players, they know who the, the, their fans, right? They know who they are. They know their stats. They know what they're about, but they know who they represent. What jersey are you wearing? We're in football season now, right? What jersey are you wearing? I don't know. I don't pay much attention to football, but what jersey are you wearing? 
who are you representing? Are you doing a good job with the representation? You know, it's like, man, I, that's my team. You know, people go out there and support their team if their team's terrible. Right? Some people, they're, they're emphatic. Their team could have lost for the past 30 years. And that's still their team. Now that's commitment. Right? Our team doesn't lose, though. It might give the appearance at times because the battles get jacked up from time to time, but our team hasn't lost. We've already won. But you've got to understand who you are. That's why I keep reinforcing this thing. But you need to understand you're a child of God and what that looks like, what that means to you. That's a big deal. Because if you don't understand you're a child, you're always going to have a slave mentality when you've been set free from slavery and brought into sonship. You've been set free from the law of sin and death and brought into sonship, the law of love, grace, mercy. That's where you're at now. That's a whole other concept. But we got to quit trying to go back. But religion wants to keep you in slave ship, and God wants you in sonship. I think I'm going to go with God's plan. That's a lot better. So therefore, okay, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, see, we already saw that, right? He was in the world, but didn't recognize Him. Here's John, we're kind of repeating the thing again. It says, Beloved, now we, are we children of God? Now, right now, we are children of God. So it went from He gave the power to become the children of God, right? The right privilege. Originally, whenever Jesus was first on the scene, he says, but now we are. Or, or now are we, the children of God. It wasn't a question, it was a statement. It was almost like Yoda speaking. Right? <clears throat> it was a statement he made. But, he keeps on, he says, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But right now, you need to establish who you are. Even though there's something else to come, but right now, you're a child of God. You're a son, you're a daughter of God. You need to get that positionally who you are. Because as you start settling that, everything else starts falling into place on how we're to walk out our Christian walk. Because if we're to walk like Jesus, you've got to understand who you are. And then interesting, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, what he said, well, if you're the son of God, did not God at the baptism say, this is my son and whom I am well pleased? So God speaks to Jesus right then at the baptism. This is my son. He gets led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. And then the devil's sitting there saying, well, are you really the son of God? Well, if you are, won't you do this? If you are, won't you do that? And then interesting, the devil doesn't change his tactic. He still asks you, saying, well, if you're a son, how about you do this? If you're a son, how about you do that? Sometimes he can be tempted to do the wrong thing to, what, test God. Because remember one of Jesus' responses, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Right? Because what? There was a promise made that said, look, if you cast yourself off, he will protect you and keep you from dashing your foot. And the devil said, well, I'll use the word too. He got slick about it. <laughs> and Jesus like, no, that's not how that works. Because what? You've got to have a full understanding of the word of God. You don't tempt. And finally, Jesus said, you know what? Enough's enough. Get behind me. We're not having this conversation anymore. We've got to learn we don't have conversations with the devil. If we're going to converse, we use the word of God. And eventually we just tell the devil to shut up. I'd rather start with shut up because I don't want to have the conversation to begin with. Because about that time the devil starts bringing doubt in your mind, shut up, we're not doing this. Get behind me. You, you, you have no place here. You have to settle that. Well, pastor, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You're a son. We've seen it three times now. At least three times. And then we have the question in Romans, well, are you going to show up? <laughs> Come on, <laughs> we're waiting. It's like, you know, when you're a kid, you're waiting for the Christmas gift to open up, right? You're ready, you know what's in that gift. You know it's yours. You know what your name's on it. It's a huge box. I want that thing open now. And sit in the rocket because you want to open it. But mom and dad said you can't open it. We talk, I really want to open it. That's creation. It's waiting for you guys to show up so you can open the gift and receive the gift. That's us putting things back in proper order. Because we have dominion. We have authority. Whose authority? God's. Through Jesus Christ. It's in us. That's the dominion and authority we operate in. But we have to start doing that. So, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's awesome. Everyone who has this hope, everyone who has this hope, I'm just going to read it one more time. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies. Oh. And then, interesting, we're always asking God to cleanse us. God, make me right. God, take this thing from me. How many times have we prayed those things? God, I don't want this. God, I don't want to take it from me. Take it, take it. No. It, 
It's up to us to cleanse ourselves. But here's the cool thing about it. Because of grace and mercy that He gives in us, that's the power to overcome the thing that we're trying to get rid of. It's in you to overcome it. It's in you to defeat it. It's in you to crush that thing because you've already won. It's you settling it. No, this is no longer a part of my life. And then, like we read a few weeks ago, you start giving God praise for that very thing. Thank you, Father, that I've already overcome this. Thank you, Father, that I have been set free. I am delivered. I am made whole. This is not part of my life. And you start diving in and you go after it. That's how you fight. Not, oh, God. That's, not a, that's, that's like defeat. You're, you're crying from a place of defeat. How can you cry from a de place of defeat when you've already won? You just haven't seen the victory. Because you're looking at it with your eyes. But you purify himself just to what? Just as God is pure. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you because of the grace that's there. And if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's a whole other story. We can talk about it another time, but just ask. It's that simple. Ask to receive the Holy Spirit, then believe that you have received it. And then go live like it. It doesn't have to be some special ooh-ah moment. It doesn't have to be, ooh, poof, lightning shows up and thunder shows up and it's like, wow. It can be very simple. You go home and say, Father, you said I can have the Holy Spirit. Now I believe that I'm saved. I believe that He has sealed me. But you said there's something else. There's something more. I want the more. And just believe it. And walk in it. And let God do the rest. Because again, we can manifest stuff. We can make things show out that's not even God. And say that it's God. Because it has the appearance of God. Right? I've been in places where people were praying in tongues and it was great. I've been in places where someone started praying in tongues and it wasn't the Holy Spirit. I'm like, ah, you shut up. They're like, you told them that. I said, I most certainly did. Because they were mocking the Holy Spirit. I'm like, that's not a Holy Spirit tongue. That was something that man was manufacturing or the devil was manufacturing. But either way, you're not going to do it here and you're not going to do it now. Now, I didn't make a big spectacle of it. I walked up right behind him. I got in there, and I said, that's enough. You will stop right now. And I let everybody else continue. And no one even noticed anything happened. The gifts of the Spirit are amazing. The fruit of the Spirit is amazing. Those things should be in operation. They should be flowing. They should be doing their thing. But we don't need to make a mockery of it either. We don't need to make it where it's some spectacle, right? Let God do what He does. All those, all those gifts. I'm going to clarify this real quick. All the gifts... If it's speaking in tongues, if it's healings, if it's all those things, prophesying, all that, that is to bring glory to God. If it's not bringing glory to God, it's bringing glory to man. That that tell you where the root of it is. Does that make sense? And the Bible talks about tongues a lot. And it talks about the fact that how it's used, Old Testament and New Testament. It talks about that even in the New Testament, it says tongues is a sign for the unbeliever. But most churches today won't allow tongues because it might offend somebody. Well, if you operate in the Spirit, it shouldn't cause offense that way. It should be a sign for the unbeliever. But when you have everybody losing their mind speaking in tongues, that gets a little confusing. That, that's where the problem comes in. That's where people say, well, you'd like a bunch of you know, barbarians, a bunch of, just, you, a bunch of crazy people, because everybody's praying in tongues. No one has a clue what's happening. That's, that's out of order. Okay? But there's a time for it. You're tired between praise and worship. If it's just between you and God, you might hear somebody praying in tongues, let them pray. But whenever someone speaks up above the crowd, then there needs to be an interpretation. Because at that point, now it's got to be a word for everybody. If you're going to make that big a deal out of it, there better be an interpretation. And then if there's no interpretation, that's the last time that happens, at least in that setting. It might, it might happen again later on, but at least for that time and place, if there's no interpretation, shut it. Keep it to yourself and you and the Lord. Wait till there's interpretation. But again, everything done decently in order. Let God get the glory. Amen? I don't know why that came up, but that's, that's where we're at. Purify yourself. There we go. Make sure everything's pure. Make sure it's pure before the Lord. Verse 4, whoever practices sin. You catch that practices sin. It isn't the ability to sin. It's the practicing of the sin. What does that mean? You keep going out intentionally doing it. It's like you want to get better at it. Anything you practice, you want to get better at, right? That's the idea. So whoever practices sin breaks the law, for sin is lawlessness, right? You know that what he was revealed to take away our... All right, and in him there are... Okay, so... Whoever remains in him does not. Sin. Wow. Now, whoever sinned has not seen him and does not know him. Right? It's not the ability to sin. It says those who practice sin. Does that make sense? It's those who are continually going after that thing. Some people have struggles, right? Some people have things that they're working through and they're working through with the Lord and He's trying to disciple them and He's trying to break those things off. Right? It's a discipline. When you first start going to the gym, your first couple of times, it is awful. 
right? Because your body's like, what are you doing to me? Are you trying to kill me? This is not good. Why did you bring me here? Right? But you keep going. It's, it becomes a discipline, right? When I was in martial arts, when I first started in martial arts, I hated it. I loved it, but I hated it, right? Because I was like one of the oldest kids in the class, and I got these little kids able to do push-ups like no one's though tomorrow. I'm over there. I'm struggling. I'm like on two. And I couldn't hardly do anything. And of course, my instructor pulls me aside and laughs at me. He says, Corey, you know, you're like the biggest one in here, and you can't hardly do two push-ups. What's wrong? You okay? You need to step up. You're looking bad. I'm like, thanks. I know that. I can see these little kids. Push it out. They're looking at me. And they're doing their thing. Because little kids are vicious. They're laughing at me, and they're poking fun at me. They're like, what I can do, and you can't. I'm like, shut up. I'm bigger than you. Right? But I had to discipline myself to get back after it. And then at a certain point, then they got mad at me because I'm up there, I'm doing push-ups. I'm just grinning because they couldn't keep up. Because what? I pushed myself past their abilities. I pushed myself past my ability. And I got to the point where I would knock out 200 push-ups. Just knocking it out. <laughs> and I was like, I hate it when you do that. Because not only would I do push-ups, I started doing shoulder exercises. I started doing circles. I started doing things where you hold stuff up. You keep it out there and do different exercises just to get these shoulders just burning. All right, let's go to push-ups. So they're like, oh, God. It was great. I loved every minute of it. But it took me discipline myself past my place of comfort to that place of being uncomfortable to deal with that thing that was holding me back. It may take you pushing past that place of comfort to deal with that thing that's holding you back. It's also part of the purification process. You've got to push yourself past that place of what's comfortable and what you know to get into the place where I say, okay, God, I may not know this, I may not understand this, but I'm going to go with you. I'm going to walk with you. Whatever that looks like, I'm going to walk with you. But I will discipline myself to be able to do that. That's why it's called discipleship. It's discipline. What? That we start conforming to the image of our Creator. That we start looking like Jesus. But we stop practicing sin. Again, your ability to do it is a whole lot different than you intentionally doing it. Because if you're intentionally doing it, then I really question your salvation. Does that make sense? If you continually persist in something, I question your salvation. And you probably should too. Because the desire to do those things should just start dropping off. And the Holy Spirit speaking to you should get to a place where you're like, mm, man, I really just don't want to do this. As you're starting to grow with the Lord, because I remember when I was first with the Lord, man, I was on fire and everything else, and I didn't realize certain things were not good for me. Right? So I would do those things, but after a while, the Holy Spirit's going, hey, that's not so good. And it was just a, hey, uh, you, you really probably shouldn't keep doing that. That's not helping you. That's not good for you. Right? It was just something would set off where it's like, man, that's, mm, I think I'm going to leave that alone. How many of y'all get those gut checks? About the time you get ready to do something, you're like, mm. probably should start listening to that. Okay? Holy Spirit's gentle. He's just still a small voice, right? Other times I feel like God's like getting on my case, he's like in my business, but sometimes it's just that little, little nudge. Hey, don't do that. Just a little nudge. And you know it. Then you persist in afterwards. Like, dang it, I should have listened. Mm, listen to what? Who are you talking to? Ah, Holy Spirit. Like, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I did you down? How do you think you knew that? Holy Spirit has a way of talking, right? Let's keep going. Verse 7. It says, little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does righteousness is what? Righteous. Wow. Who does righteousness, right? The one who practices being in right standing with God, one who goes out and lives like, hey, I'm a son, hmm. is righteous. Just as Christ is righteous, whoever practices sin is of the devil. Uh-oh. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was revealed that he might do what? Okay, so if the Son of God was revealed for that purpose and we are sons of God, what do you think we should be doing? Hmm. Destroying the works of the devil. What does that look like? Acts 10, 38. You can read the rest of that if you want to. Go back and look at the whole context. But it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We see in Mark 16 that those who believed went out and did certain things and God confirming what they did with signs and wonders that followed because what? God was with them. And God made a promise that He would neither leave us nor forsake us. So who was God with? So who was 
So if God is with you, who could be against you? If he's on your side, he says that we're sons, I wonder if we should be living different. I wonder if we should be looking different. I wonder if we should be talking different. I wonder if we should be monitoring the words that come out of our mouth and see, man, does that look like Jesus? Does that sound like Jesus? Can I see Jesus saying that anything like that in his conversation? Maybe I should change my conversation. That's why most of the time when I get in a conversation with somebody, most of the time it's going to come back to Jesus somehow, some way. It's going to get there. The longer we talk, you get me past about five, ten minutes, we're going to be talking about Jesus. It's, it's in me. That's what's going to come out of me. And I don't say that to pat me on the back. Please hear my heart in that. I don't say that to pat me on the back. But most of y'all know me. You know that's where we're going to go. If you've been around me any length of time, you know that's a conversation. It's going to happen. We're going to come back to Christ somehow. Because what? He's changed my life. He has transformed me. And He's continually changing me. He's continually growing me. He's continually making me more like Him. I love it. It's fun. Are there challenges along the way? Yes, because i got to crucify the flesh. But I absolutely love it. Why? Because He loves me. He loves me enough to take that time to spend with me, to father me, to grow me, to develop me into who He wants me to be. That's awesome. But He wants to do the same with you. And He'll do it. If you'll let Him. Because again, He's not going to force you. But He would love to be a part of that with you. Let's go back to 1 John. Verse 9 says, Whoever has been born of God does not practice sin, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot keep on sinning. That's what I was saying. Whenever that seed's there, it's growing. It's like, man, that desire to sin just starts falling off. That desire to participate in certain things just starts falling off. Right? You just you don't want to be there anymore. It ain't nothing like, you know, like I said, nothing spooky or whatever. It's just you lose the desire for it. Why? Because now you're being filled with his desires and his longings and his heart, and he begins to just shape that. And it's really cool. Now, sometimes God will tell you, hey, boom, he will cut it off of you clean which is really cool. But if we make that the expectancy, well, what about those people that don't have that event? So we can't say that it always works like that. But the seed, what does the seed do? It grows. Right. It has to die first and then it grows. What seed in you has been growing? What seed of God has been growing in you? If you look, you'll see it. If you're here, God's planted a seed. And now He's trying to water that seed. He's trying to grow that seed. It's not by accident that you're here. God knew what He was doing when He brought you here. And it may be for a season. You know what? I'm okay with that. Because you don't belong to me. You belong to Him. But while you're here, I want to make sure you're fed. I want to make sure you're watered. I want to make sure that you're growing in Him. And should that time and season come, the Lord calls you somewhere else, and I want to bless you when you go. That you'll be a blessing wherever you go. But while you're here, let's make the most of it, Right? Let's become the best that we can be while we're here. Let's do what we can while we're here. Let's be a part of doing what we're doing while we're here. Because wherever you go, you should be plugged in and committed to doing something to serve. Because you're not serving us, you're serving people. Does that make sense? That, that's what I mean by be plugged in. Because you're not just reaching here. It reaches out. But everybody should be plugged in. Because that's also part of your discipleship. Because as you get plugged in, it's amazing how much you start growing when you get plugged into something. Okay, me being a martial arts. When I was plugged in, I started growing. Right? Because I was plugged into something. Then my instructor asked me to be an assistant teacher. That's the best way to learn is to start teaching. I didn't realize that then, but I realize it now. The best way to learn is when you start teaching. Because what? You'll dive deeper into the subject before you ever start giving it out. So when it comes to martial arts, I become a technician. I'm like, how does that work? I want to know the mechanics behind it. I I don't want to just know the movement. I want to know how that actually works. What is happening whenever I'm doing that? What is it affecting when I'm doing that? You, do, you take the same thing with the Word of God. I want to know how it works. If God says this and that's what I need to do, that's how that works. Well, Father, I want to know deeper. Okay, I can give you deeper right now. Let's just get it working. Right. So when I first started learning to punch, I learned to punch. I, I, I can't even throw it wrong now because I've done it so much. But when I first started punching, I'm throwing all over the place. I don't even know where it's going, right? And I'm like, what, what are you hitting? I don't know. You told me to punch. But you learn there's certain positions that you put your body in to get the most impact out of that punch. Or whatever strike you're doing, whether it's what we call a knife hand strike, whether it's spear hand strike, whatever. You learn how to position that so you get the most impact out of it. That's where they say technique is a lot of times more important than the power that you have behind it. But now you add the technique with right power, now you're dangerous. Right? That's what made Bruce Lee so dangerous. That dude weighed like 135 pounds. But mind you, when he hits you, he hit you with a full 135 pounds plus the momentum behind that 135 pounds. 
Okay, because most of the time, if you actually look, whenever he was sparring, his feet weren't even on the ground when he hit you. They were about that far off the ground. So everything that hit you was that full weight that hit you. What? Because he was a master technician. He went in and figured out the, I mean, the science, everything behind it. How can I get the most out of this? If we'll take the time let the Holy Spirit show us, he will show us how to get the most out of this. How, so we can have the most impact in our lives, how the most have most impact in other people's lives. So what? That we don't just keep going through the same thing over and over and over again. That we come out on the other side so we can start bringing people out of the same pattern that they've been in forever so that we can bring them out. But we've got to get to a place where we are disciplined in our own walk that we can bring others out. But how do you start doing that? Bring somebody underneath your wing. Start teaching them. Start showing them the Word. Because what? It's going to challenge you to get in the Word for yourself. Right? And it doesn't have to be something super you know, theological. Just get into the Word, study it, then talk about it. That's why I like whenever I'm doing this, you guys are interacting. You guys are communicating. You're saying yes, no, you're, you're kind of okay. And I see sometimes there are questions like, man, what's that, what does that mean? Right? And I don't have a problem. If you guys are questioning something, please raise your hand. Let me know. We are kind of in a class. If you have a question, ask me. If you're not catching what I'm saying, ask me. I'd like to make it clear because I cover a lot on Sunday mornings. I want to make sure you're getting it. Right? If you're not getting it, I want to fix that. I want to make sure you understand it before you leave out of here. Even if it's just something that you can grow into, I want to make sure you understand it. Does that make sense? Is that fair? Okay. All right. Now, where was I at? Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, verse 10. Yep. So you can't keep doing that because you've been born of God. Right? We already talked about this thought by man's will, but God's will. Verse 10, it says, In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are revealed. Whoever does not live in righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his own. Brother. Wow. So if you don't love, that just tells me that you don't know God. If you're not loving those around you, then you don't know God. Because how can you know God and not love somebody else? That makes zero sense. Right? I'm not saying you have to necessarily get along with everybody or like everybody. But you will love them. Why? Because you'll see past who they are and their failings. To realize, you know what, they were created in God's image. They may not be living it, they may not be walking it, but man, God has a purpose for them just like He did for me. And if He's forgiven me, I know He can forgive them. So how do I walk in that? I love them. And if you're getting rubbed the wrong way, well, let them rub you smooth so there's no more buttons to push. Okay, verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. We should do what? Ah. Not like Cain, oh boy, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his what? His own works were evil. And God even gave an opportunity to not do it. He went to him and said, look, I know what's going on in your heart. Sin crouches at your door, but take dominion over it. He told Cain, you need to get this thing under control before it causes you problems. That's the love of the father. Look, look, I can see where this is heading. <laughs> and that just like a parent hey I can see where this is going you might not want to do that yeah. and like most kids <laughs> and there might be other sign language that goes along with that when we walk away <clears throat> right because I know better okay well Cain knew better in his own mind and then what he murdered his brother because his own works were evil and his brother's works were what? Righteous. And again, this is where when you start walking righteously, there will be those that begin to hate you. There will be those that will come against you. There will be those that talk negative about you. And, I, and I'm going to be real about this. It may be in your own home. When you start walking in righteousness, it may even happen in your own home and your own family. Because what? They start feeling convicted. They start feeling like, well, you think you're better than me. Da, da, da. No, I don't think I'm better than you. I love you. I just, man, I'm seeing who God is and I want to be like that. But it brings a conviction in them that says, I'm not like that. Your best opportunity is just to love them through it. Don't come back at them. Don't get sarcastic with them. Just love them through it. All right? No matter how long it takes. Is there a limit on God's love? Is there a time frame on God's love? No. When we get to the end of Romans, you'll see that. Nothing separates from the love of God. There's people in hell that God still loves. Why? Because they made a choice. It's not that God doesn't love them by no means. God gives them every opportunity to come to Him. Because He will. Here's the deal. If you've heard the Word, you've been called. If at any point in your life, you've heard the Word of God in any degree, God has been speaking to you. Because what? That was a seed sown. 
Something to think about. I don't get too far away from this. Now, verse 13 says, Do not marvel, my brothers, if the world hates you. Oh, there we go. That's what I was just talking about. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love his brother remains in death. Whoever hates his brother is a... Wow. And you know, he's assuming that this is something that you know, that no murderer has eternal life remaining in him. Ouch. I'm going to make this as plain as I can make it. If you have hate in your heart towards somebody, you better repent right now. Don't leave out of here today with that undealt with. Repent. Let it go. Because that hatred is doing nothing but zapping the eternal life. It says what? No eternal life remaining in him. It's not there. You cannot hate and say that you have Christ in you. You cannot walk in unforgiveness and say that you have Christ in you. Christ on the cross was saying, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If anyone had the right to be unforgiving in our standards and our way of thinking, it would have been Jesus at that moment. He had done nothing. Completely innocent. The trial that he had beforehand was a sham because they should have never done it the way they did it. That was illegal. Everything they did up to that point was illegal. Pilate tried to let him go. I find no fault in him. Let him go. They're like, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They chose Barabbas over him. Jesus did nothing but what? He healed their sick. He raised their dead. He cast out the demons. So he set people free, right? He provided food for them. And not just a little bit, he provided food for them, right? I mean, he did so many different things. There was not enough books at the time that the world could contain everything that Jesus did in three and a half years. Yet they still said kill him. So according to our standards, that'd be a good reason not to like somebody, to hate them, to call judgment upon them. But Jesus, in that moment, says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Then we have a disciple later on, Stephen, that looks up, says, Father, don't hold this against them. As he's being stoned. Stephen's love for those people, as he's being stoned, said, don't hold, this, don't hold this against them. Wow. He's being murdered. And he's crying out, Father, don't hold this against them. That's love. And that's what we're supposed to become, right? And here we go. It says, by this we know the love of God, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, but closes his heart of compassion from him, how can the love of God remain in him? See, I'm not the only one to ask the question. My little children, let us love not in word and speech, but in action and truth. Now, people have a lot of talk, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. What's that country song? A little less talk, a lot more action, however that goes. So, I don't, that's, a, that's close. But again, let's keep on going on to verse 19 and we'll close out. By this we know that we are of the truth and shall re reassure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. This is where you have to make sure your heart is clean before the Lord. Because if your heart's clean before the Lord, you, go, you have confidence before the Lord. But if you've got that nagging thing in it that you haven't repented of and the Lord's brought it to your attention, just repent of it. Then as soon as you repent of it, you're clean. Now you have confidence before the Lord. Okay, if he's asking you to do something and you keep running from it, it's going to be a little hard to go before him because you realize I've been running from that. I've been avoiding that. I've been justifying my reason for not doing whatever it is God's told me to do. That, that makes sense. And he's saying, um, are you going to do something about that? Are you going to do something about that? And here's the thing. A lot of times we get approached about things and we get called out on things. And we're like, oh, and then we get defensive. And the reality is the only thing is to do like, look, I just asked you to do something. I just expect you to do what I ask you to do, right? That's all God said. Look, I just expect you to do what I ask you to do. It's not burdensome. It's not a weight. It's not heavy. Just do it. But then when we don't do it and we get called out on it, and then we're all uppity about it because we're called out on it. Because what does light do? It exposes dark. It reveals. <laughs> but it shows a different thing, doesn't it? But it tells exactly how we have confidence for the Lord. And verse 22, I love this. This is a promise with this. And whatever we ask... Is there a limitation in that word? No. Whatever we ask. Okay. We will receive from him because what? We keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Wow. And this is his commandment. That we should do what? We believe in the name of Christ. Yep. And love one another as he commanded us. So whenever we're walking in love, and we're living in love, we become love, then whatever we go for, we should get. Right? Now, again, let's face it, in this life, we're not always going to see what we think we're going after. 
But the reality is there's still something, there's still a block there. And we have to take ownership of this. If we're not seeing the fruit, there's still something blocking it. There's some, some tradition of man, there's some religious aspect that's there, or there's some unbelief that's messing things up. Right? Or again, because if we believe, we're going to love. And if we love and we operate out of love, then so what? Well, what if it doesn't happen this time? Then you go to the next one. You know, one minister said, look, if I pray for 113 people, 113 people died, I'm still going to pray for the 114th person. Because it does not change God's love for them. I still have to keep going. You know, I was listening to the one, one minister that I really love. His mother had a certain condition, prayed for his mother, prayed for his mother, prayed nothing. Yet a week later, prays for like five, ten people, same condition, every one of them healed. He said, now, could I get bitter at God? Sure I could. In the flesh, he said, but I know the love of God is greater. He said, I don't know why that didn't happen. I'm not going to try to come up with a reason why it didn't happen. But I still have to love God and I still have to love people. And because of that, I keep going. How often do we quit because we don't get the results we're looking for in the first time or the second time, maybe even the third time, fourth time, hundredth time? Was it Edison that said, you know what? You know, you failed like 10,000 times. He goes, no, I learned 10,000 ways not to do it. It wasn't a failure. I just learned that didn't work. Right? And sometimes one thing may work in one situation and it may not work in another situation. I have ministered to people one way and I went to do that with somebody else. It did not work. Why? Because I wasn't listening to the Holy Spirit. I love how the Holy Spirit manifests differently how He ministers to people. Sometimes I may just put hands on somebody and God will do something. Other times He may tell me to give them a word and He'll do it. Other times I may just be there, I'll give a word, or I may do something else, or He may give me a word of knowledge and God takes care of it. But it's not always the same every time I minister to somebody. But if I try to pigeonhole God into a box and I'm going to miss people that could have been healed or could have been delivered, could have been set free because I pigeonholed them into a box. And so I say, you know what, Holy Spirit, how do you want me to deal with this? I'll be obedient when I get in the situation. But that's walking with God, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, right? But we know that whatever we ask, that's with an expectancy, right, that we're going to receive it. Because we love people. And verse 24 says, Now the one who keeps his commandments remains in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he remains in us, through the Spirit whom he gave us. And that's just what Jesus prayed. Father, I pray that they would be one even as, I, as you and I are one. And Father, that we would be him, they would be in me and I'd be in them, just like I am in you and you are in me. That was Jesus' prayer. Now, has any of Jesus' prayers failed? Ah. Okay. So if that's not failed, then should we not go ahead and receive the fact that Jesus' prayer has been fulfilled and we walk in that? Because none of Jesus' prayers have failed. And that was his intention that we would all be in him and that he would be in us and that we would be in the Father just as he is in the Father and the Father is in him. Then we should go with that. And stop trying to separate ourselves from that. Religion wants to keep you separate from that. Because what? Religious folks don't want you walking as a son of God. Because they feel guilty and condemned because they're not walking that way. Well, I'm a pastor. I'm a bishop. I'm this. I'm over this church. No, God's over the church, not you. <laughs> Jesus is the head. He's the shepherd. You're an under-shepherd. Figure it out. I take care of the flock he's given me, but he's the shepherd. So my responsibility is to do it like he would do it. So if I'm not doing it like he would do it, then I missed it. But who's your sheep? What sheep are in your flock? Well, Pastor, I don't have anybody. Where do you work? Where do you go to the gym? Who do you come into contact with that comes into contact with you on a regular basis? You've got sheep. Mm -hmm. How well are you shepherding? Okay. You got this. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit. You can do it. You, you can be successful in this thing. Well, it's not going to be the... Stop worrying about what it's not going to look like. Do something. Sow seed. I was raised on a farm. I know what it is to sow seed. I know what it is to not see all that seed come up. But I also know what it is to trust God and see the harvest that does come and be like, whoa, that is amazing. I would have never thought. Or plant some seeds I thought were worthless and those are the ones that actually worked. Had seeds sitting in the bag forever. And those were the ones that actually did something. I figured, nope, they were done. They were no good. But those were the ones that worked. So think about that. How about you just go start throwing seed and stop worrying about the results? Go sow seed. 
Go love somebody. Go show them Jesus. Go be Jesus. Go put hands on them, not in a violent way. Okay, you're not, and I don't think any of you are UFC in here. Don't, don't, don't use violence. Okay? But go love on them. Let the Holy Spirit work through you. Let the Holy Spirit minister through you. You may get this nudge, hey, go talk to them for a second. I don't want to talk to them. Go talk to them for a second. And the Holy Spirit will begin to give you word. Like, where'd that come from? Isn't that amazing? Holy Spirit. Why don't have that much Bible in you? If you've been here for the past few weeks, you've got quite a bit of Bible in you. Because that's really all I give you. I might give you an example, but most of what I give you is Bible. And that's the way it should be. I don't have an agenda. I have Jesus. He's my agenda. Does that make sense? I want you guys to start walking with Him in such an intimate way that there is never going to be a question in your mind any longer of whose you are and who is in you and how you're supposed to do this thing. And again, this isn't out of guilt, condemnation, or shame. This isn't out of anything else other than, hey, I want you to walk with Jesus. I want you to have a personal relationship with Jesus. I can't do that for you. I'm trying to remember exactly how that pastor said it last night about the, um, the sacrifice. He said, I can't bring your sacrifice to the altar. Because your praise is a sacrifice. Your worship is a sacrifice. And that's up to you to do that. Say, uh oh, where did she put it? What's today's date? We don't see the first name. Okay, let's check. Got to see if Miss Taylor got it in here. If not, we'll make it work one way or the other. That's the playlist. There we go. Look at her. Boy, she made that thing incognito today. I love that. But today we're getting we're going to be doing communion today, guys. So if my helpers would come help, please. We have our ushers, as it were, today, helping us out. So yeah, right there. You'll, you'll end up passing through, mom. So just take one, pass it, pass the basket down. Make sure everybody has one. And again, the thing about communion, simply think about being worthy. It's making sure you recognize and remember who Jesus is and what he did. Okay? Because remember, Paul was talking about those that were taken unworthily was the fact that they had forgotten why they were there. Because people were getting drunk at the communion table. They were, getting, they were feasting at the table. And people were going without food because they were missing it. But today as we partake in communion, I want you to remember who Jesus is. And the blood that was shed for you, the body that was broken for you, that what? We are now in a new covenant. We're in a new, better covenant. Make sure I get one of those guys. Please. And then we're going to worship Him in, in and through communion this morning. Guys, for online, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you. Be blessed. Have a great, great day. There we go. There we are. So as we partake in this, I want you guys to, again... Remember who Christ is and the price that He has paid for you.